students, I am so proud of you for being here. I'm so proud of you students for being here. Thank you all for coming, really. The rest of you, of course, you know Dr. Irvin, so you're going to be here. But students, whoa. Um, okay, I hope that you all have programs we didn't print enough. Because we didn't expect this many people. But it's not every day that you know someone retires after 49 years of teaching. So I have to say in my own defense, I've never planned something like this before. <laughs> so Bill Urban actually you know, needs no introduction to all of you. But I think his resume is such that I want to remind you of a couple of things. He received his uh, bachelor's and his master's and his PhD at the University of Texas. Surprisingly, so did I. Hook them horns. <laughs> Bill is trained as a medievalist, but he's taught so many different courses here, so many different types of history here. He's taught local history, he's taught the American West, he's taught terrorism, he's taught interdisciplinary courses, he's taught all sorts of things. Every now and then he's even taught medieval history. <laughs> Bill has been the recipient of a Fulbright grant, of two Lilly grants. He's won or attended more than five NEH grants or seminars. He was the first recipient of the Burlington Northern Foundation Faculty Award for Teaching Excellence. He was the editor of the Journal of Baltic Studies from 1991 to 1994, and he's still their book review editor. He's the winner of the Hatch Research Award here at Monmouth College, in part because he's published, I think, about two dozen books. He's also the winner of uh, two Best Article Awards, and he's the only guy I know who's actually got a preface to one of his books written by one of Monty Python members. <laughs> I tell people all that all the time, and then I go like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bill Urban has been a mentor to me for all the 21 years that I've been here, and 21 years sounds like a really long time until you start going, yeah, 49. That's not so big. So he's been a mentor to me, he's been a supporter of me. Um, I've learned many, many valuable lessons from Bill Urban about being chair, about being a colleague, about being a, a scholar, about uh, working and living in a small community about how you have to actually mow your lawn even when you go abroad for the summer. <laughs> but if I go into detail on uh, all these lessons that I've learned from Bill, uh, we'll never get to his talk. And I know that many of you in this room have known him far longer than I have, and you have your own stories to tell. So without further ado, you welcome my colleague, Bill Irvin. I did once enjoy going to see places. 
places. And I travel, uh, travel a lot, but I really like to be at places rather than see places. I do would go for six months or a year at a time. And I got into this very early because my family liked going to see places and we got to see people because we couldn't afford to go very far. Um, we traveled with, uh, uh, so we went to family trips. And so we went wherever we could go without staying at a motel, which meant living with melodies, grandparents here, that would be sort of a trip we would take. Hopefully we'd have maybe 10 others. Uh, so living in central Kansas has meant uh, Indian forts, uh, Colorado mountains, Kansas City, Salt Lake City once, Chicago a few times, and a lot of trips along long abandoned highways and byways. Uh, and this paid off when I bought uh, uh, this paper. This is where I grew up. Uh, a few people here are quite familiar with the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Paradise Valley, what do you expect? <laughs> uh, similarly, the summer I spent in District Columbia with my uncle was very important. His wife was off to California with her mother, and so I had a summer, my senior year in high school, I got to see almost everything in the nation's capital. I take the bus down in the morning and see two or three things and then come back five pounds of sweat lighter. Uh, <laughs> And got to climb Capitol and the Washington Monument, various other places so I was there. And I got to talk politics with an expert. And my uncle was a really well important man. A couple summers later, I went to Mexico City. And there I learned to converse fairly well in Spanish. And then that combined with a graduate course, a uh, graduate job, summarizing articles on the Mexican history and Spanish colonial history. Um, and with all the places I did in Mexico City, I had the confidence that when the time came when we needed a Latin American history course, I taught Latin American history uh, for, many, uh, for many years. The summer after that, I bicycled through France and Germany. And, uh, well, that's me uh, at, at that age. <laughs> Everything changes. <laughs> uh, but more important than the places I visited uh, were the people I got to visit. For example, my uncle in D.C. He was a um, extraordinary person. This is uh, from his high school, from his college yearbook, public, an alumni publication. He was a senior editor at U.S. News and World Report, which at the time was the leading hard news organ of, uh, outlet in this in this country. They didn't summarize the news, they printed large sections from speeches. And most they would do is say introduce them rather than analyzing them and telling, telling you what they meant to what was in them. Uh, he knew presidents, politicians, um, he knew all the presidents by name. Uh, he, I remember once I was there and he, he goes to him, he picked up the phone, he said, just one. And he says, is Martin there? And uh, he said, tell him Don Doan. He said, I got a quote here. I want to make sure it's correct. Read it all, got an answer. And that was uh, his relationship with Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he, he wrote all the uh, civil rights stories for the U.S. News for over a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, the more impressive was his knowledge of baseball. He a baseball team and any year. And he could give you the entire starting lineup and their batting averages. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't quite keep up with that. <laughs> so um, uh, we visited him very often. We would take these long trips back up with our children and go off to the East Coast and swing around through Texas and then back in to Kansas. And summer was almost gone by the time we got back to Mondo. Um, I learned very early that when you have speakers come to a campus, they're often left standing alone after the introductions and the talking is done, and they're sort of looking around, everybody's either afraid to talk with them or uh, interested. And um, uh, this is one who I struck up a very nice relationship with. He was teaching at uh, Telkin at WIU, 
and uh, the other historians weren't interested in talking with him. I think they, I think he was too liberal for them. Uh, uh, certainly, he was a, a really good writer, good historian, and he, we just, we just hit it off. I think if, if we had been at the same institution, we would have been friends. But he was a librarian of the United States Congress, and so. Uh, never got to see him again after that. But there have been many times when I've just moved in and sat down to talk to some important person, and they were very glad to have someone to talk to. And I think that those of you who are out there, uh, take advantage of opportunities like that. You'll spot them, they'll be there, so they're like, well, I've got my money, I've given my talk, now what do I do? <laughs> get to talk with them. Um, three of the best people I've known, uh, I met at the University of Texas. Now, there are 20, 30,000 students on campus at the time, but there's anonymity in the crowd. And so you can move through a big crowd and no one will ever know who you are. Uh, one I got to know best was my mentor, Archie Lewis, who was a dissertation advisor, employer, mentor, and model. Uh, uh, my lecturing technique is modeled on Archie's very much, at least as much as I could, although the part of always come to pause at the last lecture of every course. <laughs> Nobody in Texas at that time ever got a pause standing with an ovation from your students, and I've never got one here again. <laughs> <laughs> but Archie did. <clears throat> um, then I had two really good friends that I met. living establishment. First was my roommate, Marshall Morris. She was on the left there. Um, he ended up at the University of Puerto Rico as head of the translation department and the honors program. And twice I was able to set up uh, uh, programs uh, with him. Uh, and then the second is Lewis Kincannon, who was first chief statistician for the European Union and later uh, director of the Census Bureau. Almost a day didn't pass without us exchanging emails or occasionally calling. And I had a uh, column I was writing, and I said, Do you think this really works? And that was before you could look up things really easily. They didn't fire back a, a quick response, and uh, that was very helpful. And then they would send things to me. And these were two of the greatest punsters you could ever imagine. <laughs> and so when the three of us were together, we were probably unendurable. <laughs> but uh, it was just a, they, they were just marvelous friends. And one died two years ago and one died last year. So uh, that's a big hole in my life. I've not had that constant uh, I've often reflected if I had not gone to Texas and gone to a small school like London, I probably had many more close friends like this um, because I mean I, I, we always see this alphabetical order, so I got to meet everybody named Thompson and Vanderberg, <laughs> <laughs> and I never saw them again. You know, Five hundred students in a class, and you, 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 Thompson would just keep changing. <laughs> so, um, um, and. If I'd lived in any place other than the Stag, Stag Co-op, which was the cheapest place to live on the campus, I would probably not have met them. And that's, unless a life is unpredictable, sometimes it's just a roll of the dice. If I'd lived any place else, I'd probably never have met them. I might have met somebody else as interesting, but two people with careers like this, I don't come along very often. Um, Marshall and Lewis were responsible for my being Jackie. That's a long story. <laughs> Marshall escorted her to Germany to get married. Well, she really didn't need the help. Uh, her German was near perfect, it got even better later, uh, because she had spent a, she, University of Texas program was very good, and she had spent a summer on the Rhine where no English was allowed. Uh, but Marshall was on his way to Paris spend time with an uncle and another friend, so why not come to Hamburg? And uh, that's what he did, and he then picked up my bicycle and rode from Hamburg back to, back to Paris, where that my 
probably still resides. <laughs> <laughs> you can always spot Marshall by looking for the prettiest girl in the room. And when Marshall's son came to live with us for a year, uh, we told him about this. And all he could do was say, my father? <laughs> say anything about the people in this room today. Pericles <laughs> said in his funeral address, funeral oration, that it's impossible to praise those who fell in defense of Athens. Those who knew the fallen would complain that the speaker had said too little, and those who did not know them would say that he exaggerated. Uh, and so Pericles talked about the city for which the warriors died. And so I will talk about Alpharetta College and about people who are mostly forgotten. Some of you will know them, and the rest of you will know a little about them. I never imagined I would end up here. In fact, I'd never heard of Monmouth College before I had an invitation to uh, interview. The interview process is totally different than it is today. Uh, in 1965, shortly after being Jackie and I were living in Hamburg on $200 a month, and $100 went for rent for an apartment, one room apartment with no heat, no water, and only one working coil on the stove. Uh, air travel was very expensive, and so there was no way I could go back to the United States to attend a conference and interview. In fact, I didn't even take a trip to a neighboring city interviewing myself. In the middle of the night, I got a telegram. Uh, I don't know if any of you have gotten a telegram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, can't be on. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, they had them in those days, in the middle of the night, delivered by hand, knocking on the door, and I thought somebody must have died. <laughs> it was merely an offer of a job at the University of Kansas which came as a real surprise because I had not applied. <laughs> uh, what happened was that the medievalist there, Lynn Nelson, had a full right to Spain, but he had to find a replacement for him for the year that he would be gone. And they could not get a single applicant. <laughs> That's how rare medievalists were at the time. Uh, even ABD had never looked at it, uh, like me all the dissertation. And when Lynn called Archie Lewis, Archie said, well, maybe Bill Urban would do the job. And so Lynn presented my name to the committee. And one colleague said, we don't want anyone from the University of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so Lynn said, if you don't hire Urban, I won't be coming back. Lynn was very good. And later, when I uh, guest lectured at one of his places, one of his students came up and gave me about as high a compliment as I ever had. He said, I was struck by the fact that you and Professor Nelson have so many of the same characteristics. And then I remembered you were both students of our genius. The next year, uh, you added a, another position in medieval history, but I didn't apply because I knew that no good school would hire two people <coughs> in the same dissertation advisor. And uh, in any case, I was also busy uh, trying to finish my dissertation. Uh, I was writing two lectures a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and in the evening I would write up uh, on the dissertation and Jackie would type. And so she was uh, we were both very busy and we got that dissertation done in that year. And I was about two lectures ahead of the students. <laughs> but, uh, but, but we made it. <laughs> and toward the end of the year, the chair of the department called me and apologized for the meager salary that he had given me because that was part of the compromise beyond the retirement that we wouldn't pay you much. And uh, they lived up to that. <laughs> He said I had done a good job and started to make amends for it. He offered me a summer job. And uh, that provided enough money for the 
Dr. Mills for our eldest daughter, Elsa Bay, uh, and to be able to afford to love it. <clears throat> now, looking for jobs was very different in those days. Uh, I had a firm offer from a job in Louisiana, and it would have been close in Texas terms to Jackie's family, right there, six, seven hours. But my mother was afraid that my civil rights activities would get me murdered. <laughs> and then in 1965, 66 was still pretty, pretty rough. I wasn't worried. I, I, I was two years at Baylor and I picked up the southern accent, but I probably could have got that through it. <laughs> and uh, that would have gotten me, I uh, could have gotten me by. I, it, it sounds real if you get me a, 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 a day or two to roll into it. <laughs> Lots of jobs out there, and I would surely find one uh, that would come along. So I decided to come to Monmouth because it was on the real line, and from Lawrence to Chicago, we go right to Monmouth, so we, we could get out right down on the South D Street, I guess it is, uh, because they had numerous trains stopped there uh, every day. <coughs> I stayed with Doug and Nellie Spitz. Of course, in those days, the college had no money to put up visitors. And, manner or anyplace else, and they became lifelong friends. Uh, Doug was a scholar's scholar and a teacher's teacher. He had read everything. I read a lot, but <laughs> Doug remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I liked Mary Crow, unconventional, talkative, interesting. You know, I talk with people who come back, and well, this is way Mary liked to think of herself, she was a little older, but uh, uh, she could remember people instantly. She would look at them and say, I know who you are, and then she would pull the name out. Not very many people can do that. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton have that skill. And, uh, for me, uh, I can you, you, you come back in a few years, I can tell you where you sat. <laughs> And then I met the Dean Stafford Weeks, who was compassion and confidence combined. <clears throat> a marvelous person. It's quite proper that we have the Weeks house here. Yeah. So I signed the contract, went back, and a week later got a call from Drake University. And he said, if you show up and don't have two heads, we'll give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> and a considerably greater salary than my colleague was offering, a lower teaching those days, when you signed a contract, a contract was a contract. And so, I came to Monmouth. So we arrive in uh, Monmouth. I drove the VW out with the, uh, with the mattress, like a uh, wings on the top of a vehicle, and I managed to not have to slow down through any town we went through. <laughs> and then later I met Jackie you know, at the train station, uh, Elsa Bay in arms, and we spent the night at the Colonial Hotel, which only the really old timers that I can remember. Now, the shock was, Doug was in Madison, Wisconsin, studying Hindi, and Stafford was probably in India. It's the two people who really persuaded me to come here were gone. <laughs> and uh, now my parents at the time were living in St. Louis, so in the next eight years, we made a monthly trip down there. So that's 12 trips a year for eight years, roughly 100 trips. We got to know the roads in St. Louis very well. And my mother was never got over the fact that I was living east of the Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> she just thought that was dangerous territory. <laughs> now the job in Lawrence, Kansas, had been perfect because we could get in the car and three hours later we'd be home in Kansas. And so they could expect us to make regular visits or they could visit us. Monmouth, 11 hour trip roughly. Uh, we, we made at least three trips a year uh, forever. <coughs> so we, and the summer trip would be a long visit for a month or so. There was no possibility of not seeing my uh, great aunt's great uncle, my mother's sister. It was just something one did. And every week, 
I wrote a letter to each one of them. And the letters had to be different because they would compare them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a good practice for those of you who are out there with relatives. And, you know, uh, it's not going to be a great contribution to the world literature, but it's, a, it's a something. Now, each of those persons contributed a lot to me. More so than my mother, which you were here, see here, uh, almost died of a gallbladder problem uh, when I was uh, uh, five. So I lived with my grandparents for the first and second grades. And then every summer thereafter, I lived either with my grandparents or my great aunt and great uncle. And this gave my parents a break from the pressure. Uh, my mother probably never fully recovered from the tremendous operation to remove her gallbladder. They had to cut her. It was just like this. Yes, like, like, like they didn't know where it was. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, uh, my aunt Stella was there. Cousin Lawrence, uh, uh, that's my middle name, and uh, so we really uh, got along really well. My aunt Stella, Stella would sometimes say, "Was it you or your father that we did this?" Because my father had also lived with them. <laughs> my grandmother had a kerosene lamp, and it dropped and exploded, and it almost burned her to death. And in the months of recovery, my father went to live with her sister, my aunt Stella and Uncle Lawrence. And so that's how he met my mother, who was living in that town and going to school. But we all lived there rather than with my grandparents most of the time. Now, they, all of them were contributed to getting me through college. Um, and I would work every summer and save the money, and it became very clear to me that one of the obligations was you had to be very careful about what you spent, because they had put a lot of money and effort into saving that I had a big good education. You know, they were all very proud of their frontier heritage. Both of my grandmothers were born inside houses, uh, out on the prairie, in a real pioneer situation. And the rolling hills of central Kansas are very attractive. And so when people tell me that Kansas is so boring, so dull, I just say, well, if you cross Kansas from north to south, it won't be quite so dull. <laughs> the rivers run east and west, and if you go on the highway, you'll never see anything. But if you go on the other roads, Kansas is a beautiful uh, state. Now, my mother's mother lived there, too, but she didn't speak to my father's folks. Um, my father's folks drank a bit, and they played cards, and danced, and my mother's mother didn't do any of these things. And so, and she was living in Kansas and in the same town. Um, I always made a point of visiting her every day. And so I got to know her much better than my brother did. And she, too, had had a fascinating history. Uh, she had been widowed with four children because her husband was diabetic and uh, he was a doctor and when he should have been uh, home resting, he went out to deal with people in a typhoid epidemic and died a year before the invention of insulin. Mm -hmm. Grandmother went back to high school, graduated with her own son, and then taught. Hitching the horse to go out to country schools to, uh, to teach. And so she um, uh, was quite a good now, either she or any of my relatives that I heard among the college, but my father's parents were Presbyterians. My other grandmother seemed to be Presbyterians, or at least Christians. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had some relatives in Chicago. Uh, but uh, I had no nearby relatives in of my father's family, and his grandparents. So when I was in high school, we all went to a family, urban family reunion out in California. <coughs> grandfather, uh, uh, he was very quiet. Uh, my father reasonably quiet, and when I'm not talking, I'm quiet. <laughs> 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 um, and so when I observed this huge family all running around 
talking, eating, putting ice down one another's back, reading poetry they had written themselves. And I'm going, this is, this is a pretty strange operation. <laughs> but, uh, uh, this was this big, close German family. And the closest I saw to that in Kansas was the Thursday evening uh, picnic where my grandparents would invite, say, 20 people and have homemade buns and homemade uh, ice cream. And we would eat, and the kids would run through the neighborhood of Wyoming's Indians out in western Kansas. You know what western Wyoming's Indians would be. And uh, then we would play cards, and that allowed me to make a little spending money. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, that, was, that was a big in, in, impact on me, uh, values in particular. Now, I didn't go into the military because the year I graduated from high school was Sputnik. Now, this little satellite that the Soviets put in air changed everything in the United States. Uh, the United States said we're behind in science, behind in technology, behind in foreign language, and so they poured money into these. And the draft boards and everyone else said, we want you in the university, we want you studying. We need you there, and they had far more people than they needed to train. But they needed people who knew their science and their languages. And so I took uh, four lab courses in science, two courses in psychology, a course in math, two years of Russian, one year of German, two years of physical education. Which I think it was a rather better preparation for life, a better liberal arts education than what most students get here today. We really knew uh, a wide variety of subjects and uh, uh, they were taught pretty well. Um, now, if I'd gone to a school like Monmouth, I might have had fewer choices, but I'm sure the rigor would have been uh, privileged or something, because that's what almost everybody did. <coughs> now, if you'd seen me when I first came to Monmouth, I think you had sort of an idea there. Um, no beard, curly hair. I weighed 15 pounds less than I do today, and I could run a six-minute mile. And eventually, um, Jack was in pretty good shape, too. Uh, she did a lot of running, particularly when we were in Germany. Uh, when the children were old enough to walk, we rarely <coughs> used the car except to go get groceries. We, we did a lot of walking. And, uh, uh, eventually, I couldn't outrun my daughters. I couldn't drive my bike farther than my son, who took in 100-mile trips, whereas I would go to Little York and come back to the city of Now, because we spent so much time abroad, I see, and I, that's why we did travel with students here. Um, I spent a lot more time with the children than many people I knew. And uh, here they are. I don't remember whether I took this or Jackie took it, but uh, uh, we, I'm sure we used the long lens because this is unposed. And uh, this meant they, they spent a lot of time with each other. And I spent a lot of time with that sort of check. It's not a bad thing. Now, I got to know a lot of professors who were very close to their students. And professors didn't always agree with one another. But they were always, they were unfailingly polite. And we talk about civility today. They disagreed in those days strongly, but they were always polite. They always had good manners. I particularly got to know, as I say, Doug Spitz and Mary Crow. Mary I didn't see as much because she lived in that little blue house over by the parking lot. And uh, students came over there to visit her, to have classes, or to borrow it to make proposals. <laughs> so, it was a person who could be counted on in any classes. I got to know Cecil Brett, who was a very fine man. Very quiet, a Canadian veteran of the war who taught Asian history. So we had a very strong Asian history program. Uh, Roy McClintock, uh, who 
was so exciting about the political process. He just, he just loved politics, loved it. He was really in Norman Weldon, though, that he came from an Oklahoma populist background. He, he was really left-wing radical. But he just loved to talk politics. And so it didn't matter whether you were right-wing, left-wing, or no-wings at all. Norman was your person. Program was called government because that's what he was interested in the process, not the theory. And uh, that worked really well. His wife uh, ran the League of Women Voters, and so we had a very active League of Women Voters uh, here running the nonpartisan debates. Uh, Cecil was so soft spoken that Japanese students just loved him. He just had that, you know, he, did, he, he, was, he taught Japanese. And he just had everything down right. The students loved Cecil. Uh, I don't know that he had a single enemy. Uh, I can't imagine who would find anything about Cecil being angry. Now, there were people who were very different, like uh, John Ketterer in biology. Uh, down there, in the, you know, he was dean of men one year. And uh, John was a very colorful person. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and he, he was he was just energy all the time. And after he retired, he was over in what is now the Presbyterian House. And so every Friday, I would go over and do, uh, share sherry and uh, talk. John was always a delight to talk with. Another person I we talked a lot with was uh, Bernice Fox. Now she single-handedly kept classics program going through administration after administration that wanted to kill it. <laughs> and because of this, she refused to go on sabbaticals because there might not be a program. <laughs> <laughs> and in order to teach Latin and Greek and classics, she taught overloads. And in those days, nobody ever complained if you wanted to do a little extra work. She placed her graduates across the state so that the Latin teachers all knew Bernice Fox and they all said, you go to Monmouth College, you will get a good Latin education there. Uh, the teachers loved her at the conferences. She would she had to give these talks showing uh, New Yorker cartoons of myths, uh, sometimes a little risque. Um, she didn't have a PhD because at Ohio State, the Gender discrimination was so great that she just dropped out of the program and took a job as a well-paid executive assistant. And when a job all plumbed up at Monmouth in the English department, she jumped on it because her love was teaching. And then she sort of forced her way into the classics program uh, against the will of the classes that we had. She said, you sit there and don't say a word. <laughs> Now, we were on the same system as uh, Knox is today, the 3 3, and so and we had an exchange. Bernice and I would take the back of the shuttle over there. Uh, Knox didn't offer classics, and history didn't offer, or history didn't offer medieval studies. So at one point, they had a straw poll of who the best teachers on the Knox campus were. Uh, Bernice came in first, and <laughs> second. <laughs> so we were dropped <laughs> from the final uh, uh, group for consideration. <laughs> um, after two years, Knox hired a full-time class assist and a full-time medievalist. That is, the enrollment just kept going up. So um, Bernice was exceedingly thin. She had had a, a, a very bad amount of cancer when she was uh, uh, here in her early years. And so, uh, Point, I remember she said, look at this, they billed me for a pap smear. There's nothing there to smear. <laughs> <laughs> in those days, operations just meant they cut away everything. And that was why Bernice uh, never accepted any of several offers of marriage. So, uh, <laughs> now, um, when they finally cut the money, those who remember, 
much for Jerry Classic. Bernice assumed that it would be named for her, and it wasn't. And she was mightily disappointed there. But um, she lives a bit. She was a feminist, but she had nothing good to say about the latecomers to feminism because they suggested that her generation just lacked gumption. And she said, they don't have a clue what they're talking about. And she said, we fought for our rights, and we earned it. She said, why should I give up something because somebody 25 years of age just happens to be female with a PhD? Or at least had a sharp tongue. <laughs> well, the year after she retired, uh, trying to hire a person for the classics chair. The dean kept bringing in ABDs, and finally I went to the dean and said, look, it's embarrassing to give a chair to a person with a with an ABD. He said, I suppose you want to do the search? I said, yes. <laughs> I heard signs protesting the war in Iraq. But when another person had a sign that had something about the president on it, he would go over and say, you must have manners. You are trying to win people over, not antagonize them. That was Doug all the way. He had his beliefs, but he said, you have to express them in a proper manner. Uh, not many people would have known how strong Doug was. He had a very severe back problem. So he lifted weights secretly in the basement to build up the muscles. And I imagine he would have had a good chance arm wrestling any one of the NRS teams because he just had muscles. And he was so quiet and so gentle, he would never have known it. Uh, Mary Crow, unfortunately, didn't live to enjoy her retirement. Uh, one day I, I was in my office and a student came running down and said, you've got to come up fast. And something's happened to Mary. So I got up to the uh, room she was lecturing in the Wallace Hall. And she was there standing frozen. So I got her into a chair and then had an ambulance called. And uh, the daughter got a lot of today. They would probably have been able to save her memory. But uh, the ambulance, she was, she was essentially paralyzed. And she lived on for about, about two years, uh, very unhappy. The only thing she could remember was to go down and get her hair done. Very, hair dudes are important in those days. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, she uh, was very sad because here's this vibrant woman, loved to travel, loved to speak with people, and she's there very Every day, her husband, Bernie, visited her even through snowstorms that would essentially cut Roseville off from Marvel. And after Ernie died, uh, Mary died, Ernie continued to work for the college, and I think was one of the people who uh, sort of is an example of what uh, a spouse, uh, one of the college supporter uh, can be. Uh, I knew uh, Ernie partly through a bicycle And through the parties <coughs> at their home. And I know one party started at about 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and Jackie and the McNamara's uh, and I uh, finished it up about midnight. Mary knew how to throw a party. And, uh, so it's a lot of fun. Another comfort, old uh, Harry and Irene Osborne uh, were special favorites. Uh, they came from Carlton to put foreign travel into the NFL program. They, that was their specialty, especially taking students to France. But Irene came down with rheumatoid arthritis. 
And so she had so many joints replaced that she said she was really the artificial woman. <laughs> and she could not get into a chair or out of a chair without help. And so Harry had to change everything. He learned to avoid college politics and national politics because he had given a, 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 a kidney to a brother uh, earlier on, a kidney failure, and then he uh, had a heart attack. And he could see that if he died, Irene would be left essentially alone because their two adopted children were still very young. But they were, without question, two of the great conversationalists of the world. They traveled, they knew how to talk, they understood everything, uh, and they were great cooks. They were among the founders of the Gourmet Club, which right there. Yeah. So uh, this was half faculty, half town, and, uh, and mixed them up so you never had the same group any two meals at all. Well. Boy, these were elaborate international Harry and Irene was welcome visitors, and um, since Irene couldn't get up to answer the door, it was knock, open the door, yell, and then go in and talk with her. Many of the times since I walked right past that house, uh, I, I went in to see Irene, and then Jackie would go in on other days, so I don't think they passed that we didn't go uh, visit with Irene. Just a Unfortunately, they moved away, uh, and uh, I don't think we ever saw them after that. Now, there are three men in um, religious studies who were extraordinary people. I, I got to know all of them very well. Stafford Leakes was uh, extraordinarily humane. Four times he filled in as academic aid, and four times he was wise enough to return to the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves Stanford, and after he retired, we went to the faculty, to the faculty coffee at the library because they had a coffee and cookies every Friday afternoon. And Stanford would always be counted upon to be uh, at, at that place, uh, and so we we had a chance to talk. So Paul McClanahan was born and raised in Egypt, and he came to Monmouth like his father and his grandfather to study here then went home. He became president of the um, Asiwood College, a Presbyterian school for uh, Christian girls. And was there until the Nasser government came to power, at which time they expelled all foreigners, including people like Paul McClendon again, who was born and raised in Egypt. And they closed the Christian school and turned it over to a fundamentalist group for boys. So if you look up Asim College today and the Asim Hospital, uh, you will see uh, that it's not what it was uh, back then. Uh, we used to send five students a year to teach either at Asim or at Alexander Girls School. And that was 100 years ago when the student body was about 500. So our relations with Egypt were very long. And Paul just loved to speak Arabic with our foreign students. So we always had a, a number of students from there. And he was one of those gentle people. Uh, he was also a social liberal. He, uh, he was a freedom writer. Uh, twice he took me along on his trips with students to, uh, we went to Detroit and Chicago. And if you go on a trip with Paul McClanahan, you would really work from breakfast to midnight set up with groups. We met everybody. And a marvelous experience. Uh, his opposition to the Vietnam War cost him a number of pastorate uh, positions. And uh, he said, well, it's all very many. Uh, he held to his position very strongly. Charles Spiel, uh, up at the top, is a, he was a great scholar. I once met a fellow at a conference and the teacher saw he said, well, the college. So I said, yeah, he said, the smartest man I ever met was from London College. <laughs> I said, Charles Spiel. He said, that's the name. <laughs> uh, he held industrial patents from World War II. He had played 
soccer at Harvard. He knew how to row and to sail. Uh, he studied in India and Europe. He insisted his students learn Latin, Greek, some Hebrew, and hieroglyphics. Uh, and he would never come back from Boston until the socks were eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> discovered, I think we probably all discovered the Canova Stone, which today is in the library. We got together and assembled it and talked to Bo Fried about uh, doing something with it. And Bo said, we don't have any money to display it. So the next thing we know, Bo Fried had gotten into his own personal bank account and made to have a display made. Those three men are not close personal friends. They were colleagues, but they didn't hang out together. Uh, similarly, the people in biology, they didn't spend their weekends together. They made a great department, but they didn't have to be close personal friends. And so it's a special pleasure to hear Ketterer, who is a strong agnostic, you just made it mud. It made with Charles Spiel. He was a very devout Presbyterian, and they would go after each other, hammer and tongs, and then walk out with their arms around each other's shoulders. Mutual respect. Way they go. Uh, Milt Coleman, who was the other one there, was a true eccentric. Uh, and he got tired of students coming to class, he locked the door. He wouldn't unlock it. So the students who find them leaning against the glass. Uh, Milt learned love German beer and couldn't get it except in Chicago at very high prices. So uh, each time we went to Germany, I'd bring home two bottles and then uh, ride out on my bike to New York and we consume them. After he became registrar, he could tell you exactly what the enrollment was going to be in the fall. Presidents and the uh, director of the mission had said, You're wrong, it's going to be. Milt was always right. <laughs> he was just a. Uh, I also spent a lot of time with the librarian Harris Halby, who was very proud of his Norwegian heritage. <laughs> and he would talk about having the smallest budget for any library in the museum in Ufta. <laughs> 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 But he always provided excellent service. He absolutely refused to accept my suggestion that we that we uh, clear up the problem of students thinking soft drinks in by setting aside a little area where they could buy a Pepsi and drink it. He said, no, libraries are serious places. <laughs> in charge of probably the finest moment I can remember in the college when we moved all the books from Carnegie to the new library that didn't have the name to us yet. We moved it in one day in low freezing temperatures. We canceled classes and we moved it. It was just a marvelous day for everybody. Uh, I had keys to all the library places because they didn't have the hours to keep it over and open it so to get into I also had all the keys to the gym because I was coaching soccer and uh, I needed to get into all the story trees. So I had a gigantic key for example. So they said, boy, you must have more of the president. I said, the president only needs one key. <laughs> <laughs> so um, having a lot of keys, that just means you're sort of a big janitor. Um, I had no uh, very small budget and no bank ever got paid. <clears throat> But I got to meet some really interesting coaches, and most particularly Bobby Moore. Uh, he told me about uh, Bobby was like a true gentleman. Really, I liked all the coaches, but I especially liked Bobby. Uh, it was, he deserved having the uh, field made for him. And while I was coaching, I got to meet some extraordinary students. One of my favorites was Cy Reagan, uh, who was killed by a drunk driver at a country road crossing. Driver hit him in the rear, but he was at a stop sign uh, and uh, broke his neck. And he had lingered for months before he finally died. We have a side ring trophy hmm. for uh, uh, his 
sportsmanship. Uh, and then as the founding advisor of CBT, I got to know quite a few of the members pretty well. It was a reformed fraternity. They were going to do everything differently. They said there would be no casing because the, fresh, the pledges will do their own their own program. They all submit a proposition to the members and they will then approve it and from that point on the pledges start. And um, I was at every 11 p.m. meeting except one. That was the one where they voted to buy a Great Dane as their mascot. <laughs> <laughs> and I told them the point of having a fraternity house is to get girls in, <laughs> not to scare them away. <laughs> came back to interview for the college history. Uh, and uh, I really got to like him. Uh, I, I wrote the book because Carmen Davenport's book ended in 53, and we had reached the 25-year period in the whole three wanted to college history to uh, cover the last four sessions. Uh, I got to know Duncan Wimpress, uh, all energy. Duncan saw a group, a student musical group, he would immediately go over and ask the drummer to let him play a few bars. And after 20, 30 minutes, they might put him back in. <laughs> um, he would say, first class colleges go first class. So we paid really well. And our pay, we were in the top rank of pay in the United States. Now, one year I had 335 students in my classes. I got, I was paid really well. And that was, that was a nice pay to pay. Um, I would never take a ride in Duncan's airplane because he, play, he flew his airplane, I heard him say, way he skied, and he ended up a couple broken legs. <laughs> <laughs> At least one. Uh, but uh, uh, apparently he had no peripheral vision. He just saw that one way. Uh, uh, Dick Stein. Uh, was, was not a happy day. Uh, it, was, it was an extremely difficult time. We went through very uh, hard uh, financial problems. Uh, and I won't speak about any of the others because we have an amazing collection of presidents, of ex presidents at this college. And I think it's very unusual uh, for a school to have as many living ex presidents as we do, including Bruce Haywood here. Bruce and I uh, worked together for quite a while because you were there 14 years. Uh, the top of the people in administration though has to be uh, Aileen Moya. Uh, Aileen knew everyone, knew everything. She'd been at the college since 1935, but only in the president's secretary since the early 50s. And she was ex very uh, efficient. I, when I was running the Journal of Baltic Studies, and uh, uh, we didn't get any release time or anything like that, we got it. I figured this was in the college. And I had some people uh, by helping me. Uh, 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 I was the instructor back there. Uh, and then I had a person in political science helping me. Uh, the major help was a uh, uh, professor of French. So, and he went away that created a real problem because uh, he had been taking over. I always believed in sharing, uh, sharing the work. Uh, I didn't mind sharing the title either. I just really wanted someone to share the work. That's so why I called and he answered, we're really behind here. We've got to help us get our correspondence going. Well, she came in and she organized it just like a Russian. Well, she was Finnish, which is sort of like Russian with uh, 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 real passion. And uh, we had to snap too. And get everything done. And uh, she had uh, uh, Jackie and me and uh, Sigmund just to suffer uh, quite often. She, and then when she retired, uh, I got to see her very often in the retirement home because she was out there very close to my parents and uh, sometimes in the same place. And they knew every secret of my college. <laughs> she told me all of them. Thank <laughs> you.
do because we didn't want to uh, to print the, uh, the history. He said he wanted to be a college president. If I showed the problems that the college had in the 70s, uh, uh, no one would ever hire him. <laughs> I said, so I sent back a revised chapters, eliminating all of this and describing how he would counsel students at his office with this big uh, body painting on the wall of a young woman showing all of the anatomical details. He wrote back and says, get rid of that and put anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was found in the college in the south. <laughs> then there are people that are Latin, love together as staff, and I got many more of them that I can talk about. There are two that are important. He told me about and uh, audiovisual. Uh, he was a veteran of the Polish Army in World War II. And after he was captured, the first day of the war, he captured his brother in law, was in the German army. But the Germans knew that he spoke German, so they put him in one of the battalions cleaning up after American air raids. And as a result of that, he was considered a collaboration, collaborator. So he couldn't go back to Poland. And he stayed in Germany, working for the U.S. Army, married a lovely woman there. Once he went back to Poland and took the money and met at the airport, his relatives said, well, we really just need your money. Gave him the money he was going to use to make a visit, turned around, and flew right back to the United States. So um, I really liked uh, that guy. Uh, he's the one who helped organize the audio visual we have today, Ian Jerry Osborne for Modern Tour Language. And so if you see that uh, Mary program, he does a projection with, the, with places from multiple projectors at one time, so we would have three scenes going close together with music. So the programs would be quite complex, and this is where we would bring parents on Parents' Day uh, to see these uh, programs. And uh, when my wife and I were gone for two years, for a while, um, we came back and the house was so clean. It's never been close to that clean. <laughs> Talk about eating off the floor. Boy, they knew how to clean a house. And Dennis Johnson, he was just real, he was just energy. We'd give him an electronics problem and he would work at it and he would get it done. And because you are not too far down the line. So, uh, uh, and these are the people who started with this group. Secretaries, I've known so many good secretaries that and most of them are so far, not all. But uh, the problem was we just get them trained and then some administrator would grab them. <laughs> and so we were sort of the training ground for the college of grades. And then there were the custodians. I've gotten to know a lot of custodians. And the trick there is you just talk to them. And after a while, they start talking back. And I mean, in a friendly way. Um, and I would advise any dean and any dean to get a position like that. I really want to know what's going on in the school or in the business. Go so talk to the green room. Go talk to the custodians. They are the ones that really know what's going on in the school. It's sort of like that. You want to know what's going on in Mondo if you go to the hairdresser. <laughs> I know one faculty member who had to get his hair cut, and that's where he learned he was being fired. <laughs> so, what does this say to you all here to, to be good with? First, I get to know older people, much more interesting than uh, people your own age. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, might start with your um, grandparents and uncles and aunts, and when you reach middle age, this is how you know when you're middle aged. Um, you start. You should take time to visit them after they're retired, and I uh, believe me, they'll find time for you. Meanwhile, think about the people who had an impact on you and on your lives. And if it's good, um, tell them so. And if not, wait until you are old enough to assess the situation. <laughs> so, thank you.
program, but there's two more things very oh, quick, very, 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 very quick. Um, I'm, I'd like to call upon uh, Tim Morris, who is a uh, classics and information, and in this hat he's wearing, he's representing the classics club. It's hard to follow the speech like that, but I've got a few words uh, that make this presentation. How does a student with hardly four years of modern college education adequately pay tribute to an educator who has given nearly 50 years of service? This was the question I asked Dr. Sinkwitz, albeit less eloquently and much more of a panic, <laughs> when uh, I was asked to uh, present this gift from the classics department. Dr. Sinkwitz told me about how when he first came to Monmouth, the classics department was basically a one-person department, how Dr. Urban was extremely welcoming, and how the two became fast friends. This friendship is still strong today. Just ask either of them to do anything during the holy swim hour. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Urban has also helped supplement classics courses with history courses on Rome, Greece, and the ancient world, which many classic students over the years have benefited from taking. I have been lucky enough to take four classes with Dr. Urban, the Peloponnesian War, Crusades, War and Peace, and the Renaissance. When peers ask me for advice on taking a Dr. Urban class, I say, turn in your work, late or not, check your syllabus, and do not try to BS anything on a research paper. <laughs> Dr. Urban has read, donated, or written just about every book from the library I've ever used for a research project in this class. <laughs> another thing that amazes me about Dr. Urban is whenever we read a text from another country, he has the text in its original language in front of him. One time in Renaissance, I forgot my copy of Boccaccio's to Cameron for a meeting. Dr. Urban quickly offered me his copy, and when I pointed out it was in Italian, he said, you take Latin, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Dr. Urban, in honor of your nearly five decades of unwavering service, for being a friend to the classics department, and for being an amazing educator, I am honored to present this scroll, signed by our majors and minors, on behalf of the Classics Department. Great job, Mr. Morris. Uh, joining us now is Ms. Victor Salyers, who is the President of Files of Theta, the History um, Honorary, International Honorary Society, and Corey Pearson, who uh, is in charge of the History Club, and they have a very brief presentation. The man you see before you has given close to five decades of service to Monmouth College as well as to the community at large. His extensive knowledge has been an asset to the faculty and students throughout the years. His area of study in the Baltic states with a subspecialty with Western American and local history shows the extent of his expertise on a broad range of historical topics. His influence has reached beyond the area of history in that his numerous contributions have brought the college new ways of thinking and learning. In addition to his wide and useful influence, Dr. Urban has published over 25 books, as well as many murder mystery novels, which truly exemplify the meaning of liberal arts. As a gift for his many years of service, the history department has put together a memory book dedicated to his influence at Monmouth College. It is full of good wishes and great memories from some of the countless students you have helped and privileged to learn from you in the classrooms from Wallace Hall to the countries of Europe over the years. Dr. Urban, we wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you all for coming.